from the WAQP studios in Saginaw, Michigan, it's Michigan Alive, proclaiming the gospel to the Great Lakes Bay region and mid-Michigan area, giving glory to the Lord in word and in song on Michigan Alive. Shalom, hey, and welcome, welcome to this edition of Michigan Alive. It's a delight to be with you today. I want to remind you as we are on the program today, there are prayer partners ready to take your call. You can call in and uh, have someone play, pray with you uh, and talk with you and encourage you today from the Word of God. Perhaps you have someone else in mind that you want prayer for. Maybe you want to intercede for them, our prayer partners are here and they are ready to do that today, to take your request before the Almighty. On Michigan Alive, this is one of the programs that the TCT Network has uh, really uh, been uh, very uh, effective in producing. So I want to thank you, Dr. Garth and Dr. Christina Kuntz for this program, Michigan Alive, and for the many, many guests that you have allowed to come on Michigan Alive and for those of us who have hosted over the years. Well, today we have a, a guest on Michigan Alive who is from the Saginaw area. Uh, I don't think he was born in the Saginaw area, but he is in the Saginaw area now and he is involved in ministry. And oh my goodness, he has uh, uh, written a book and done some great things here. But once again, Call the number on your screen as our prayer partners are standing by, ready to take your call. I have a scripture I want to share with you. It's one that you're familiar with. You probably came out of the womb but quoting this verse. That's just joking. Yeah. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't have to perish, but you can have everlasting life. God so loved the world. I call that the three M's of God, his motive, his, his, uh, his uh, you know, method, and his message. He so loved, that's his motive, he, that he gave, that's his method, and whosoever believeth in Jesus, that's his message. Well, we're going to be talking today with uh, a guest, and our guest has written a book, and our topic today is Saving Souls in the 21st Century. So would you please welcome, and, and I'm not going to do this strong introduction because I want to draw it out of him as we are talking. So would you please welcome Minister James Sanders to Michigan Alive today. Welcome. Thank you. Minister Thank Sanders. You. So good oh, to be here. It's a joy to have you here. Now, realizing that in your denomination, you're referred to as minister and so on, and others in their denominations would call you pastor Correct. and so on. So, so Minister Sanders, you have, uh, how long have you been in, in the, uh, the uh, mid-Michigan area? Mid-Michigan area. I've been here in Saginaw for the last, it'll be three years in September. Um, prior to that, it was 10 years in, in Beulah with the Beulah, Beulah Church of Christ. Where's that? Well, for the people who don't, don't know where Beulah is. Got my is. map with me. Yeah. <laughs> We're right here, and Beulah is over, over here on the other side, just uh, west of Traverse City. Very beautiful place. And cold in the winter. And cold in the winter. Saginaw is cold in the winter. Yes, it is. Yes, it you is. eat a lot of seafood over there? Um, yeah. I, 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 they catch a lot of salmon. Yeah. And I'm not really a big fan the of salmon. The Chinook salmon and stuff yes, like that. You know? But they're, they're all over. Uh, but I, I, I'll go fishing with them. <laughs> so, my goodness. And, and you are, first of all, I want to ask, you're married now, yes, right? I and am. you have children. Yes. Okay, let's, let's back up before I get into that part. And, and you're, also, you are, you are ministering, you're on the staff at a, a church in the Saginaw area. Yes. What's the name of the church? The Center Road Church of Christ. Center Road Church of Christ in, yes. in Saginaw. Now, how did you give your heart, how did you happen to give your heart to Jesus? How did, how did that happen? Well, um, how did you when get I saved? was probably about 12 years old, uh, there, was, there was a point where... You know, and first of all, I had a drug problem when I was younger. Uh, my mom drugged me to church every Sunday, Wednesday. <laughs> but you got over that, Pastor Dan Willis, you got that. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, instead of it being my mom's faith, it eventually became my own faith. And at the age of 12, I was baptized into Christ. My sins were forgiven. I was added to the Lord's body and... Uh, Walked faithfully, started preaching actually when I was 15, 16 years old. 
but when about age 17, uh, there were some problems in our lives, and well, I left the Lord, and for 13 years, I was away from God, and it was miserable. Uh, and I would call it the pig pen of, uh, of life, and God put me down hard. But praise God that uh, he allowed me to live and, and come back to him, and uh, ever since, I've just been on fire for the Lord. So praise God that he, he allowed that to happen. When did you meet your wife? met my wife uh, over in Germany. Oh, boy, how long has it been? It's been 26 years now. Um, this was after you came back to, to the Lord? No, this was, this was, Before this you was came still back. living out there in uh, the life of sin. Yeah. Um, but we met in uh, Germany. We were both in the Army, and we came back here and got married and have uh, two wonderful kids, Jessica and Jill, and oh, have two awesome. grandkids now, uh, Roxy and Riley, and uh, just uh, can't be happier. What drove you away from, uh, you know, the things of Yahweh? There, there, are, there are people who, who can relate, and I'm asking that because there are people who are watching who have walked away and some who are on the verge of, and, and they think their situation is, you know, it's just the worst thing in the world, that there's no hope, and they're just giving up and doing that. You know, right. you, you are a success story because as you left, you came back. And so that's, that's, that, that, that's hope. There's hope for you with that. But so, uh, you don't have to go into all the details if you don't want to, but what drove you, what caused you to, that pushed you in a different direction? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very honest about things. Uh, first of all, I was uh, 17 years old. Uh, you know what happens when you're 17 years old, and the friends and the peer pressure and things like that. Uh, at the same time, the church that I was involved in was, uh, it had a split, and I was kind of caught in the middle and very young and vulnerable at that time. My, my parents also got a divorce that year, and... That's a lot. It, it was a lot. It was a lot, but no excuses. I still chose to walk away from God, and I, I left and got into, um, you name it, I did it. Uh, never killed anybody, but I thought about it. So uh, <laughs> the Bible says if you hate someone, uh, then, uh, then you're guilty of, of that sin. Well, when you get disillusioned in leadership, if a ministry is splitting, a church is splitting, then, I mean, you've got to choose, so you're stuck in the middle of that, and then you, you see the, the challenge there with people that you look up to and right. you respect, and, and you're torn with that. And yes. then when, when, when the parents go through their divorce, that's, that's a hard thing, too. Even though they're not really, most of the time, not divorcing the kid, but each other, right. but you, you just feel caught Again, you feel caught right in the right. middle of that. So, exactly, yes. So that's a lot to, to, was a lot. to go through. Even though you, you said that's, that's not really an excuse, but it's understandable how something like excuse, that. Not an excuse, no. Yeah. yeah. And um, at that time, was there anybody trying to encourage you to, to, to be consistent with? Absolutely. I equate this to uh, uh, Timothy, uh, his, his mother and his, his grandmother. They prayed for me every day. And I, I get letters every once in a while from, from a minister, from one of the elders of the church, and they'd write me, you know, periodically. But I was gone for 13 years. Yeah, that's a while. I was gone, yeah. You went into the military, did you? I went into the military, yes, yep, for, okay. uh, for three years over in Germany, and I came back. and. Uh, what branch of the service? The Army. Ah, oh, thank you for serving in our yeah. armed oh, forces. Yes. I have uh, uh, a son and two grandsons uh, in the Army, and my son made a career of the Army. He's Actually, he's retired now, okay. just retired about three years ago. That's wonderful. But my two grandsons are uh, still in, yeah. That's great. Yeah, and so you served three. That's, that's an area of the service. That's where the body bags are in, yes. in the Army. So that's, you yes. don't choose the Army, you know, for a vacation. Right, right. <laughs> no. So why did you choose the, the Army as there opposed to some other branch? Well, there weren't any jobs, uh, you know, up in, in northern Michigan. I just, uh, just, I don't know, just chose the Army, really for no, no apparent reason. Just at that time, I just needed a job. Well, what a brave young man you were at that time. Too. Well, I don't know about brave. <laughs> and uh, so now you're in the in the army, and while you were in the army, you met your wife. Yes. Okay. Yes, Patty. In Germany. Yes, in Germany. Patty. Yes, Patty. Patty, my my wonderful wife, Patty. Well, how did that happen? Tell us about that. How did you? Well, I mean, you know, again, we were, you know, not living for the Lord, so. You know, there's not a, a, a lot to tell there. Did she have a, a, a religious background at all? 
Oh, oh so this, the, when you came back, then this was all new to her then. And right. just, right. and she probably didn't have all those, those, uh, you know, shortcomings and those handicaps to get over because she could approach it from a whole right. new perspective. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, and then what brought you back? Uh, the pig pen. Um, I was actually working for Budweiser for 12 years. I went from straight from Budweiser uh, distributor to uh, Sunset School of Preaching in Lubbock, Texas. Wow. And God wow. put me down and put me <laughs> down hard. And I said, that's enough. I think we'll do something different here, God. So I uh, went towards them and not looking back. Not planning on going back to Budweiser. <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. What was it like when you came back to, to Jesus and you, and what was that like? What did, even, what did it even feel like for you? Well, just, just to know that, uh, that God can take away all of our sins, uh, all the guilt of all the sin that uh, you get caught up in uh, in life. And, uh, you know, that's, that's the beauty of the Bible and really knowing the Bible, to know it to be true. Uh, it's not just grandma saying, hey, you need to get back to church. Uh, um, when God puts you down hard, uh, there's only one way to go, and that's up. And just to learn that, that, that Jesus is our propitiation. And in the Bible, that means that he satisfied God's wrath. Wow. And God's wrath was against all of those sins that I did. And they were just piled up to heaven. And just to know that those went on to Jesus, and Jesus paid for those sins. Uh, that really gets into your heart. Yeah. That really gets into your soul, and it makes you go in a different direction. It forces you to change and want to want to do something different. Serving Him. Did you think about any of of the things that you had learned at twelve and thirteen up to seventeen, when uh, when a sudden shift happened in your life, and uh, and your life took a different direction? Were there ever times when the Spirit was nudging on your heart or anything? Oh, absolutely, yes. You'd always look back. You see that with the Apostle Paul. Um, uh, Apostle Paul would go back and retell his story of when he was Saul of Tarsus and persecuted the church. And, you know, there, there's a balance in that. There's a balance in we don't need to wallow in our past and it, to, to bring us down. Satan would like to use that to just make you feel so bad that you never return to the Lord. Uh, but it can also be a good teaching tool uh, to be able to look back and see what you had, then you lost it, and now you can have it back. So, ab absolutely. That's good. I, and I can hear somebody saying, yeah, I wanted to ask that question. Were there ever times? Sure. You know, absolutely. And, and then you came back and you ended up going to, to, to school. You ended up in the, in the ministry. Yes. Um, I shouldn't say ended up in the ministry, that was strategic. You had planned to, to go in a ministry. When did you first sense a call on your life for, for the ministry? Well, I guess it was even back before I had left the Lord. Oh. Uh, when, you know, like I said, when I was at 15, 16, I, I, of course I wasn't a full-time minister or preacher, but I was, you know, I'd, I'd do a sermon here and there and, and I could, you know, you just get to the point where you, you know, you just have to speak the word of God. And um, so when I came back, uh, I knew it was either all or, or nothing. So um, uh, now, praise God for that. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. If you just tuned in, I'm, t we're, I'm talking to uh, Minister James Sanderson, and uh, he is a, a minister in the Saginaw, Michigan area. Hello, Flint. But he's in the Saginaw, Michigan area, and uh, uh, he's at uh, Center Road uh, Church of Christ in the Saginaw area. He's written a book, Saving Souls in the 21st Century, and he has work, you know, has other material regarding that that we're going to talk about today as well. Now, when you came back to 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 Jesus, you you and your that she got saved at that time, or she actually came to the Lord just prior to me coming back. Oh, okay. So she was baptized um, probably maybe a good year, maybe a year and a half before. And right. so she actually helped me to <laughs> see the light. So it was harder for you to stay, stay out there longer. It was. It was getting pretty lonely out there. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's really good. <laughs> and uh, 
Uh, so, and then you have two children, you said? Yes, Jessica and Jill. Oh. Yes. Yep, well, Jessica lives in Texas, and Jill lives with us here in, uh, in uh, Saginaw. My goodness, what are their ages now? Uh, 22 and 25. Uh, dad remembers, dad remembers. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, 22 and 25, wow. And, and um, so when you came to the mid-Michigan area, this was about three years ago, you said. About yes. That, about that. You were uh, ministering at a church in... Uh, Up in uh, Beulah, Michigan, in, in yes. Beulah. yes. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, remember that, like Beulah Land? You know? Yes, sweet Beulah, Beulah, Beulah Land. Beulah Land. Everything's Beulah biblical Michigan. up there. <laughs> uh, we lived on Grace Road. Uh, Crystal Sea or Crystal Lake was right next to us in the town of Beulah. So everything was... I had to keep it Bible up there. <laughs> What's the population? What's the population? It was only about 400, but uh, the county is about, about 12,000. Well, that's good then. So, wow. Yes. And then it came into to this area. Yes. Minister James Sanderson, how were, when were, and how would you explain the motivation for writing a book, a book called Saving Souls in the 21st century. Well, thanks for asking. I, I appreciate that. Um, when, when you first get into the ministry, you get out of preaching school and, and, you, and, you're, and you're with the congregation, uh, you're all excited and, and you're getting to know the people. And people started, would come up to me and they would bring people to me and say, hey, I've got a person you can study with. And I'd, I'd be all excited. I'd be like, yeah, this is great, you know. Um, and I would study with them and try to lead them to the Lord. And then somebody else would bring somebody else and somebody else. And, and after a while, after uh, the flattery kind of went away and, uh, uh, you know, feeling good about this, I started asking myself, well, why can't they teach them? And so I would approach them and say, well, well, why can't you have a Bible study with them? And their answer was every time, well, we don't know where the verses are. We don't know how to lead somebody to Christ. We sent you to school, so that's why we bring them to you. So after I heard that for quite a while, I said, you know what? I need to put something together, an easy to use workbook to sit across the table and to lead somebody to Christ, trying to answer the, the most asked questions that they're asking today. You did a good job at it. Thank you. Yeah, my goodness. What has the response been? It's, it's been good. Um, sold uh, over 4,000 copies in just over four years. That's uh, awesome. Also did a video series uh, based this on the book. This is video series. Yes, the video series. This is designed to uh, use in an adult class. Uh, they're 20 to 30 minutes long, uh, based on several of the, the, the different studies within the book. Mm. And as you were writing uh, the book, how did you go about choosing uh, your chapters? The subjects. Yes. When I was in preaching school in our evangelism class, they had us put together, uh, how would you lead somebody to Christ? What, what points, you know, kind of point A, point B, point, point C. And what I discovered is, is that there are never two people the same in this world. They're in different places. They're, they've come from different backgrounds. And so I have never used a drawn out, laid out way to lead somebody to Christ because they're in, they're, you know, their minds, their backgrounds are different. So I thought to myself, why don't we put together the most asked questions that people are asking? And that's why it's entitled Saving Souls in the 21st Century. I mean, you just got to know that, that the subjects have changed over the years. The gospel never changes. The Bible never changes. But the subjects out there are changing. I mean, I mean, think about this. Do you think that they were talking about evolution 300 years ago, coming across the, the prairie in a covered wagon and saying, I don't know if I can really trust this Bible or not because, you know, we've, uh, you know, Darwin was over there in the Galapagos <laughs> Islands and uh, he saw this and saw that. Those things weren't, were not discussed. Those things were not talked about. So today there are some new subjects. There's new religions. There's new theories within religions. And I'm trying to address those uh, and, and bring them back to the Bible. In fact, one of the things about the book is, is there, there's over 750 printed verses. So this isn't just me talking. I try to back up everything with Scripture. This isn't about my opinions, my ideas. Uh, but I, I want to address the, 
the questions that people are asking today. What have been some of the most um, um, frequent questions? A couple of them that you. Well, when I when I study with people, uh, one of the questions are, "How can I trust the Bible? Mm. How can I trust this Bible?" And how do you answer that? Well, I, I have four different studies. There's 38 studies in the book, but but the the four that that, that consist of is is first proving the resurrection of Jesus. I believe that if we can prove the resurrection of Jesus. And, and show that he truly rose from the grave, yes. that will make this whole Bible correct. Because that same Jesus talked about Noah, talked about Abraham, talked about Isaiah, yeah. talked about all the things of the Old Testament. And if he really rose from the grave, that makes him the son of God. And that means that Jonah, when it talks about Jonah and he was swallowed by a big fish, he was really swallowed by a big fish. And I... I I, I wish that every Christian could, could tell the story of the resurrection and prove it, and it would just roll off their tongues. If you think about it, in the book of Acts, every time the, the apostles went on and preached, it was always about the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection, the resurrection. It's powerful. You need to, mo need to know that. Wow. And what's another most popular uh, concern or questions people have? Well, yes. Um, one that's of the, what you just shared is really, that's really prevalent today. Yes. You know, it really is. Uh, j just within that uh, uh, subject, there's also one on uh, translations of the Bible. A lot of people ask, well, hey, my version reads one way, your reads another. How am I supposed to trust what you're saying? So I have a section there. Uh, archaeology. There's a lot of people watching A&E and the Discovery Channel, National Geographic. They're watching shows on the Bible, and that's putting more doubts in their minds. And so that we need to, to show that archaeology and the Bible match up perfectly. And one of, one of them that I use is the, the, the Red Sea Crossing. And then the other one is the prophecies. The prophecies about, about, about Jesus are, are just enormous in the Bible. We need to share that with people. Uh, one of the questions I had asked the other day was, uh, well, you know, Muhammad and Allah, right? Uh, they, they worship the same God as we do. And I really challenged that. Good. And, I, and I said, look, you, you need to look at your Bible and you need to look at the difference between Jesus and Muhammad. Um, Muhammad claims to be the Messiah and Jesus claims to be the Messiah. But when you start looking at the Bible and knowing your Bible, there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, Muhammad came from Ishmael. Okay. Uh, Jesus came from Isaac. And there, you've got that seed line, and you can follow that seed line all the way through your Old Testament. But the prophecies are huge. So much is told about Jesus, when he was going to die, how he would die, when he was going to come, um, just everything about his life, uh, his mother, virgin birth, right? So much is laid out. When Muhammad came along, there's nothing said about Muhammad. In fact, the only one that gives any credence to Muhammad is Muhammad. So you can see there's, there's a big difference between the two. And we as Christians need to, need to know these verses and be able to show them from the Bible. And that's why I wanted to put something in, in front of them so they can go back and, and reference this and actually sit across the table and show somebody because the scriptures are powerful. Yes, yes. And then being able to, uh, believers being able to talk about these verses themselves back yes. and forth about it helps them to, to, to learn them Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Now, when you looked at, when you were sharing a material on, uh, you know, the authenticity of the scriptures, uh, people wanting some evidence, some proof regarding that, what's one of the other things that you, uh, another example that you can share that you shared, like for instance, uh, people are saying, how do you know the Bible is true? What about the, uh, the books of the Bible, as you said, the, the different ones? Right. Do you take them back to any, what type of archeological things do you take them back to? Well, I, 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 like the, I like the Red Sea Crossing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's really powerful. Um, in all of your Bible maps, it shows that, that the Red Sea, that Mount Sinai is in the Sinai Peninsula. Well, you got to understand there's a difference between the maps in the back and the scripture. Okay? Scripture's inspired. The maps are man-made. And what I try to show is, is that there, there is no archaeological evidence 
that Mount Sinai is on the Sinai Peninsula. Somebody slapped that on a map and they've been going with it ever since. If you actually follow your, your Bible, you're going to see that Mount Sinai is in Midian. And I have not found a map yet that put Midian on the Sinai Peninsula. And if you, so if you go over to the land of Midian, which is actually in Saudi Arabia, you find all kinds of archaeological proof. And you can, you can just follow your map and you can see where God hemmed the Israelites in. I have, I have maps in the book. You can see where they got hemmed in. They came to this huge beachhead. They were trapped. Um, God purposely put them down into this, 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 this uh, riverbed so they could not get out. Here comes the Egypt, Egyptian army. They're right behind them. And you come to this huge beachhead. And what they found on this beachhead, and why we know that this is where the Israelites were, is because we found a pillar there. It's about 30 feet high, and it has an inscription of King Solomon. And King Solomon says that this is where Pharaoh and his army died and where the Israelites crossed. Well, it just so happens that the Gulf of Aqaba is 5,000 feet deep, very deep. Now, how are you going to cross and get to the other side? It's eight miles across. It just so happens where this riverbed comes out, and what do riverbeds do? They drop sand. There is an underwater bridge, and the deepest part is only 90 feet deep. And today they've sent down, uh, uh, you know, cameras and pictures, and they have went down and they've seen, and they've found, they did not find chariot parts. I mean, it's been 3,500 years. But they found the coral that yes. grew around the chariot parts, and you can see the shapes of the chariot parts and the wheels and the axles. There's, on the other side, there is uh, uh, another pillar. You can go just down the f street and you can follow through Exodus and you can see where the 12 wells and 70 palm trees were. You can see this, the rock that is split where Moses uh, spoke to it and, and water came out. And you can go right around the corner and there's Mount Sinai. And, and one third of the way down, it's blackened on top. And right at the base, just like it says in the Bible, they got smote the mountain. It was all of a, all of a blaze. And right at the base of this mountain sits a huge pile of rocks. And what do we find on those rocks? Twelve written, printed Egyptian calves. What did the Israelites do? They melted down their gold and worshipped the Egyptian calf. And it's right there. You can take archaeology and take your Bible and just hit every single point. And I think that's powerful if you have somebody that's doubting the Bible and and watching these shows on TV and saying, hey, I can't trust this thing. Yes, you can trust that. But the beauty about this book is, is that this book is designed to take the person where they need to go. Maybe you already have a person that already believes in the Bible. You would skip right over those, that chapter and go to wherever they need to go. And so that's how this book is designed. And, and for believers, it's a good setup for a spiritual walk. For believers who, who have given their hearts to Jesus, but have never been able from a historical or, uh, or an objective perspective share their faith. Right. They couldn't go back and, and pull out the evidence that you, that you have and so forth. When they're reading this, it gives them, it gives them a, a greater foundation Absolutely. to draw on as they're, they're sharing. Yes. Um, I can remember talking to people who had given their hearts to Jesus and they would say, well, you know, you explained to me things about him. I never knew this. Um, I would ask my parents, why do we go to church? And they would say, well, because our parents went to church. Right. You know, and that's what we do and that kind right. of thing. And why do you, you, why have you trusted Jesus as your, your savior? They would say, well, it's, it's, it's what our denomination does. It's the religious thing for us to do. And they had, some of them had a genuine relationship with Jesus, but could not explain it at all. Right. And I, and I find that, that, that very prevalent in our world today. That uh, Even when we have our food bank there at, at Center Road uh, Church, and we'll feed up to 800 people a month, and they'll stand in line, and as they're standing in line, I'll go out and talk to them about the Bible. And I'll You're wanna, feeding 800 people a month? Yes. Yes, up wow. to 800 people. Up to 800 yes. people. That is... Um, quite an evangelistic ground. Oh, it is. It is. And I, we want to feed them spiritually uh, uh, just as much as, as with the food. And, and we're thankful that God allows us to have that food. But one of the questions I'll ask them is, how do you know God exists? Well, usually the answer that comes back over and over and over again is, I feel him in my heart. And I said, now, if you were to go to the other side of the earth 
and you would find some people who are worshiping Buddha, that person would say the same thing. I can feel it in my heart. Or if you went to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca, and they're going around Muhammad's birthplace, and there's millions of, of Islam walking around that place, well, you could feel it in your heart. I said, you're going to have to do better than that. There's got to be more than just feelings, because feelings can be subjective. That is subjective, yes. Yes, and so I, I try to get away from feelings, and I try to get back to facts. How do you know? Now, the Bible says, well, we walk by faith, not by sight. But why did God put all these prophecies in the Bible? Yes. Why were they given? It's to prove who Jesus is. So there is proof. I mean, there's a lot of things I haven't seen. I haven't seen heaven. I haven't seen Jesus. Uh, but how do I know they exist? Yeah. By the things that God has given us through his word. And it's powerful. So we need to know those things. Yes. Well, we do have subjective reality. Those are things you can feel and sense. They're not tangible. You know, electricity is something you, you know it's there, but you can't see it. Right. Uh, and, and, but yet, you have the objective reality of electricity. Yes. You know, you, <laughs> if you don't do certain things, um, I mean, certain things you do is evidence that is there. Right. When you have the the cables and things like that, and you and you stick your your wet hand into a, a socket, you know. I mean, there's some evidence that is there. So right. the objective reality is going back to the historical aspects, to the archaeological aspects of things. Yes. Um, scientifically, there are some things, but other things oh, sci scientifically is some things scientifically is kind of difficult. Like proving uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, how would you say, it? death, burial, and resurrection of, of Jesus. You can do that historically and with other objective means, but scientifically it's like ivory soap. Right. If you push it down scientifically, you repeat it. It repeats. It, it, it flows back. So objectively, from a scientific perspective, proving the resurrection, you can't because he would have to die all over again and be raised. Right. But subjectively, based on all the objective historical, archaeological proof, Facts, yes. over and over again, uh, scientifically it's proven. He, yes. People get saved and they, they, they give their hearts. So you do have that evidence, but yes. once again, some people uh, have some objective truths, but they don't pursue it far enough, long enough, to right. give their hearts to Jesus. They just have a little bit of historical knowledge. Exactly. But you're saying there's a spiritual side of this, but the spiritual side, you can see the reality of it through the objective side of it right. uh, by in the history and so forth. Yes. Now, how have you been able to equip people uh, in, uh, to, to share? You have your, your book and, and, and uh, your tape series. Yes. How do you get people to, to actually uh, look at it and, and, and want that and say, ah, oh, this is not something I should be afraid of. This is right. something I should embrace. Well, first of all, evangelism is a hard sell, okay? <laughs> um, people want Don't books on <laughs> angels, make me feel good, uh, yeah. help me to fix my marriage, uh, raise my kids, things like that. But Help you me come, to get a lot of money. Exactly. And so and so yes, and, yeah. yes. But when you come out with a book on evangelism, they're like, hey, that's, that's going to take some work. Yeah. And so you really have to get it into, into their hearts. First of all, you've got to know that people are lost. Yes. And I think a lot of people today would think the people aren't lost. I mean, they see them, they see people on the streets and go, well, they're, you know, they're good people and they're not a whole lot different than me, so. Well, nowadays, all you have to do is die and everybody says you went to heaven. Every funeral I go to, yeah. the person always goes to heaven. <laughs> Isn't that something? But then when I come to the Bible, Jesus says, wide is the gate, broad the road that leads yeah. to destruction, and many enter through. Yeah. And, and small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find. Yeah. And I say to myself, the world's saying one thing. Jesus is saying the other. Uh, few. I don't know how many few is, and I don't know how many many is, but it's got to at least be this number has to be bigger than this number. Yes. Uh, less people will go to heaven and more people will not. Yeah. That's a scary verse. Um, and again, if you prove the resurrection, then you've got to look at the authority of the word. You've got to know that these are, these are true. But I always ask people this question, why? Why would people go to hell? Why would people go to a separated place for eternity from God? How do you answer that? Well, I, I try to answer everything for the Bible. I, I just want you to know 
It's not about me and my opinions. My opinions don't count. Everybody has opinions. It's about Scripture. The Bible says the very next words out of Jesus' mouth is, watch out for false prophets. Mm. Do you mean that false prophets have something to do with leading people or causing people to go to hell? Apparently that, that's true. And if you, go, if you go just down a little bit farther, it says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, it says, in the next verses, it says, many will come to me on that day. It's got to be judgment day. And say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out many demons in your name and do many mighty things? And then he turns to them and tells them, I never knew you. That scares me. That tells me that many people are going to come to God on judgment day with full confidence. I know who you are, Lord, Lord. And God's going to turn, Jesus is going to turn to them and say, I don't know you. How could that be? How could that be? And the next verses explain it. It says a wise man is the one who heard God's words and put them into practice. He built his house upon the rock. The rains came, the, ru the streams rose, and it was firm because its foundation was on the rock. That's Jesus. But then Not the only did it rise, but it beat vehemently, strongly, right. aggressively against it. Exactly. Yeah. But then you have the foolish man. And the foolish man heard God's words. Okay, I heard them. But he didn't put them into practice. He didn't do anything with them, right? He, he knows Lord, and he could say, Lord, Lord, but did he do anything? Did he do the will of God? Apparently not. Now, he built his house. He built it on the sand. And when the rains came and the, and, the, and the streams rose, it fell with a great crash. Some versions say its destruction was complete. We're talking about salvation there. Those things frighten me. And so I have a deep, deep concern about the lost, the lost in this world. And so I've tried to put something together to, to help lead people to Jesus. There really are lost people, and we see them every day around us. This is Michigan Alive. If you're just, you know, surfing a little bit, channel surfing, and we're talking, I'm talking uh, to Minister James Sanderson. He is the uh, minister at the Center Road uh, Church of Christ in the Saginaw, Michigan area, the mid-Michigan area. And uh, he has uh, written a book and a workbook on saving souls in the 21st century. He has some training material um, regarding that. And the material, his tape series along with this, uh, uh, is, is this a, actually a tape series or d d CD? CD. There's, uh, there's DVD. four DVDs in there. These are DVDs, the DVD series. That's, that's good because uh, it's a visual, right. you know. And, and so we're talking about salvation today. And uh, it's a delight talking with him. What is your favorite scripture, one of your favorite verses? My favorite scripture is Hebrews chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Mm. Uh, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father in heaven. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Love Why those is that verses. scripture so important to you? That's Satan's and what job. Have, and what have you pulled out of that? What have you been able to glean from that? Well, that's Satan's job. The Satan's job is to make all of us grow weary and lose heart. That's, I mean, he... You know, you know the phrase, he doesn't wear pajamas, he yes. doesn't take a day off. Right. He's always out there trying to get us to lose heart. And the key is, is to fix your eyes on Jesus. And I, I like the part of the verse where it says, for the joy set before him endured the cross. And the question is, how could the cross be joyful? I mean, we're talking about a terrible scourging. We're talking about hanging there on the cross and the nails. The joy is you. Mm. Jesus was thinking about you. He was thinking about me when he went to that cross. That is his joy. Wow. And he wants us to stay focused and stay focused on him. What does that mean to fix your eyes on Jesus? What well, with Peter, you know, he, he was out there on the boat and he, he saw Jesus walking out of the water and wanted to go out to him. We know the story well, right? And, 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 and as long as he was focused on Jesus, 
He was doing fine. Ah, don't lose focus. Don't lose focus. Don't and as long as he was focusing on Jesus, he said he was doing fine. Yes. And then? Then the waves. <laughs> that's life, okay? All the things that we go through, and it, it gets us distracted, and we start paying attention to other things, and we start losing heart. And the key was, look back to Jesus. Mm. And so when Peter took his eyes off, he started to sink. And it's true. Try it. No, don't try it. But you know it. That's what's going to happen. If you take your eyes off of Jesus, you will start to sink. Yeah. And, and then consider him. Yes. You think, what, what, does, what did you get out of that? What, what, how has that ministered to you? And how have you been able to minister to others through that? What does it mean to consider him? Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. Mm -hmm. uh, something that we do in the churches of Christ is we take communion every Sunday. Uh, the Bible says uh, the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. And so we follow that pattern. One of the things that you'll notice about the bread is the bread that we use is unleavened. It's flat. Now, when I was up in uh, the Beulah area, sometimes the ladies of the church would forget and leave the bread out. And we would come back a whole week later, and we would take that bread again. Once again, the Beulah area, that's Beulah, Michigan. Michigan, yes, thank you. That's an, an area with a population of around 400, but the county is about 12,000. Correct. And you had pastored there, uh, ministered there how many years? Uh, 10 years. 10 years. Ten and then you came from there to the middle, uh, to, to mid-Michigan area, to Saginaw. Right. So once you were, so and you had communion a lot in, in the Vila area. We always, we always took communion every Sunday, but the, the, folk, the focus is, or the point here is, is the bread. Mm. the bread would be left out a whole week and it would never mold. Well, Jesus, this represents Jesus' body. Now, if we took regular bread and we left it out, it would mold. You yes. leave it out for a week and you're going to come back and it's definitely going to be moldy. That's what yeast does. It's a contaminant. And if you, if you study that out in the Bible, you're going to see that yeast many times is connected to sin. Jesus had no sin in him. The text says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so we don't grow weary. He was sinless every single day. That propitiation, he satisfied God's wrath. He's the lamb without blemish. Every day he got up on this earth and never sinned. We need to consider that. We need to follow his example. It, it, can, it can be done. We can, we can live a life, and we can rid sin out of our lives. The problem is we just choose not to. We need to start making different choices. Consider him. Follow him. Follow his example. I'm so thankful that he was... If he loved me that much to be sinless and to never give in to sin, that tells me I need to follow him. So the focus... Uh can be on, on Jesus, especially in, in a world, in today's world, where everything else is considered. All the excuses are considered and so on, uh, because he's the God of the hundredth chance and so on and so on. Right. Sometimes it's almost like a license to do whatever a person wants, to go as far as they want without him. Uh, and yet at the same time feel like if they maintain a little bit of religion or religiosity that they're okay. Right. Um, but people have the concept that they really can't do the right things. You right. Know? So what they can't do right, they begin to, to find a way to, to make it a social issue so that it becomes an acceptable part and a normal part of society. Right. So we can't do this and you're calling it sin or you're calling it something else, we want to call it normal so that we don't feel abnormal or guilty when we're doing it. So how do you get people to refocus on the Word and to come to know Jesus personally and then to begin to walk a life that's considering Him when there are so many social pressures and, and, and governmental pressures nowadays right. that's saying sin is normal and it's, it's not what, you, what some people call sin is legislated as something that is normal and it's not sin. Right. But yet the scripture says it is. 
That would bring me to, the, to chapter 6 in my book, How One Becomes a Christian. Okay. And we go to these great commission verses. Uh, Jesus said, uh, All authority has been given unto me, therefore go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teaching them to obey all that I have commanded, and surely I am with you to the end of the age. There seems to be three parts to that section. Make disciples. Now, a disciple is a follower. Then baptize them in. And that word in, the, in, in is the word ice in the Greek. It's, it means the point reached. So as soon as a person is baptized, they are now in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They are in the family of God. And then you bring them up out of the water and you teach them again. But the question is, how do you get somebody to follow? When I was growing up in my years of walking away from the Lord, I'd have a couple of friends come by and they'd bring a couple of cases of beer and I'd follow. They gave me a reason. That was a bad reason, but I would follow. And what we're not doing today is we're not giving reasons of why to follow Jesus. Why would you follow him over anybody else, including yourself? And Jesus talks about this in Luke chapter 14. But we need to understand that it was only Jesus that could die for us. I'm sure, do you have children? Yes. Would you die for them? <laughs> yes. However, when they were 15 and 16, uh, when they were two and three, yeah, I would die for them. At 15 right. and 16, I went, uh, you You'd think twice, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know about this dying for But I think most people would, <laughs> would say about their kids or their grandkids, if, if God said, and even, even Paul talked about this in the scriptures, that uh, would we give ourselves up for somebody else? Yeah. And even though we may be willing to do that, say, God, take me and let my kids have eternal life. God would never accept that because right. we are contaminated. Even though I would die for, for yes. my kids yes, or sir. most of them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, you know, what good would that do them? You know, because I'm not Jesus. I'm not God. It wouldn't, in that sense, regarding their eternal life, it wouldn't do them any good. And we're contaminated. God wouldn't accept our right. sacrifice. But right. Jesus, again, was spotless. He, he satisfied God's wrath and only him. If we realize that, those guys with a couple of cases of beer, um, they can't really give me what Jesus can give me. Right. I, I, I like, too, that, that nobody loved me like Jesus. Ah, that's the truth. It's, 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 it's amazing. I, I always try to get picture, people to picture the cross. Think about the cross. What was the scene there? You had, they were gambling for his clothes. I know we see the pictures and Jesus is hanging. He's got a cloth around him. I don't think he had any cloth around him. I believe he was naked. When, when the Romans would put crosses outside of Jerusalem, they were right on the roads. This is the Passover. You've got over a million people coming into the town of Jerusalem during this feast. Here's these crosses. These, this, Jesus is naked. You know how humiliating that is? Women and children are all walking by and they're gambling for his clothes. Just a few minutes later, you're going to have a, a, a Roman and he's going to take a spear and pierce Jesus' side. And it said a sudden flow of blood and water came out. And the only way for that to happen is to hit up underneath the rib cage and puncture possibly the heart and uh, the lung area to get a mixture of blood and water. Uh, the, the Pharisees are, are hurling insults at him. You know, if you, could, if you could save others and raise others from the dead, why can't you save yourself? And then where's his best friends at? All the apostles left. The only one that came back is recorded in Scripture, and that was John, the Apostle John. And, and he's looking at this group here, right? And he, and he makes this statement. Here's, here's, here's the people before him, which really is, is us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If that was me, I would have torched the place. Yeah. I would have just said, there's nobody here that deserves anything. And just be done with them all. And, and, and Jesus had that power. And yet, he continued to hang on that cross and died. And when he died, he satisfied God's wrath against us. If you understand that, if you realize that, you'll follow Jesus. And the last thing, and the most important thing is, Revelation chapter 1, verse 17, 18, he holds the keys of death in Hades. They're taking our best friends. They're taking our wives and our children our, and, and people that we know, and they're going down in the grave. It is the most 
devastating point in our lives and we're looking around and we're, we're looking for hope we're looking for some can somebody help me and nobody can help us except for Jesus he's got the keys he holds the keys of death and Hades in his hand he conquered death he paid the penalty and him and him alone can get me out of the grave and Jesus says we're all coming up and we're gonna be judged on how we lived that's somebody I'll follow. Yes. And we need to get somebody to make that commitment before they follow. They're going to follow Jesus. And then we take that person, we baptize them into Jesus. You take that dead body of sin and you bury them. You raise them up to walk a new life. Their sins are washed away. And then just keep teaching them and teaching them and teaching them. And, and teaching them to observe. When he said, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you, or truly, I am with you always, even right. to the end of the age, and so on. Teaching to observe. How do you view that? If you're teaching people to observe, um, what are they being taught? This is a big Bible. Mm. Um, that's another thing I do in my book before a person is baptized into Christ. I try to, try to explain to them about covenant. Which covenant applies here, yeah. right? Uh, God made a covenant with Noah. And I ask people, are you building an, an ark in your backyard? And they'll say no, and I'll say, why not? Well, God never made that covenant with you. He made a covenant with the Israelites, right? And he told them to make sacrifices and do animal sacrifices and worship on Saturday and these things. Uh, I've asked people, do you keep the Day of Atonement, the Passover and things like that? And they say no. And I ask them why, and they need to understand it's because God did not make that covenant to them. So God has made the new covenant for us. Now, we're going to need to know this Old Testament. You won't understand the book of Revelation. You won't understand the book of Hebrews, the book of Galatians, Romans. There are so many quotes from the Old Testament. In fact, I don't know if I can show this on my page here, but uh, Romans chapter 10, uh, there are just... I use a yellow marker in my Bible, but you see, I don't know if you can see this on the camera, how much yellow was on those pages. Those are all quotes from the Old Testament. So even though I'm not under the Old Testament covenant, I'm not going to understand these New Testament uh, books here unless I understand those quotes from the Old Testament. That's going to help me to bring it back into context. So to, to observe all things, can I have a ham sandwich under the Old Covenant? No. If you understand how the Bible works under the New Covenant, knock yourself out. Have a good spiral ham. <laughs> and, and then as you uh, uh, share regarding observing to do, what are, you would think of two of the, the major things that, that Jesus or Paul would encourage a believer to do. What would you What would you say? Well, we're, to, we're uh, Ephesians chapter two verse eight says, "It's by grace you've been saved through faith." God's part is grace. He died on the cross. That's it's unmerited favor. I can't tell Jesus to scoot over and let me pay for part of my sins. But the other part is faith, and that's our part. And the Bible over and over and over again teaches an obedient faith. It doesn't teach a perfect faith because Jesus was our perfection, but it does teach direction. And so we need to go in the direction of God, looking at the new covenant and saying, God, what do, you, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to live my life? How do you want the church to be structured? It, it, it really amazes me. On, on Center Road, there is, I, can, I couldn't tell you, maybe 13 or 14 different churches on that road. Do you, want, you know why there's 13 different churches? Because they're all teaching something different. Is that what God wanted? There wouldn't be that division. So it, this Bible is not that hard to figure out. Look at the church. Look how he structured it, how, he, how, how, how it's supposed to be structured, and, and design the church after him. It's not about us. That's one of the things, if you'll come to the, the Church of Christ on the center road, you won't see my name up there. It's the Church of Christ. Jesus says, upon this rock, I'll build my church. So again, we're trying to follow that pattern, that blueprint, and that is part of that walk of faith. You do, or do you, put uh, questions and answers on your uh, 
your marquee or on your bulletin board or your sign? Or yes, yes. Uh, our, a good friend of mine, Rick Rezio, one of our deacons, he goes out every uh, couple of weeks and he puts out another question and always with a Bible verse there. And we get so many calls uh, saying, uh, hey, uh, you know, I looked up that verse and uh, oh, that was great. And people are encouraged. So again, just trying to lead people back to the scriptures. And, oh, and, and by the way, I, I need to say this. This book is never to be a substitute for the Bible. This book is to lead people to the Bible. This book is inspired. This book is not. Please understand that. If you were to pick one thing from this book that you would want to get into someone immediately, what would it be? Immediately. Boy, there's so much in the book. Just understanding, yes, <laughs> the, understanding the plan of salvation and, and how to get, to get to Christ. But in part of the book, I, I challenge theologies. Um, the Bible will talk about this in Matthew 15, about uh, people making up uh, traditions of men. Okay? Now, there's traditions of men and there's traditions of God. And there can be sometimes differences. I, I want to put the traditions of men aside. There's lots of theories about the Bible and things like that. I'm worried about the ones that have to do with salvation. When I see a subject that connects with salvation, forgiveness of sins, being saved, that one's important. And, and one of the things that is taught today is the plan of salvation. How does one get into Christ? Um, and so in, in chapter 7, I try to deal with, with some of those things. And one of them... And, and I just want you to think about this. It's the sinner's prayer. The sinner's prayer, accept Jesus into your heart, accept him as your personal savior. That has been taught so many times, okay? And so I hear people say that, but then I go to the scriptures. And what I did in my book is I printed out every single conversion count, and they're all found in the book of Acts. And when you read every account, what they were told to do, what they did, what they, what, what the apostles and others said, there's one word that is missing from every single account. There's 25 of them. The word prayer doesn't exist. In fact, if you go to the first conversion story in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2, right? And you, and you, and you see this, you see in Acts chapter 2, uh, when they came out and they, um, uh, you know, the people were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and other apostles, what must we do? Uh, said to repent and be baptized. So just, I'm just challenging you with that. I'm just challenging you with scripture. Don't take my word for anything, but just go back and just, just check these things out. Wow. Minister, Minister James Sanderson, thank you for being on Michigan Alive today. Appreciate it. You know, what a joy. We're just about out of time and we have uh, less than a minute or so, but you have been blessed today by his sharing. Remember, call the number on your screen, and we have prayer partners to pray with you. We're going to pray now as we go out and say goodbye to you as we speak the Word of God over lives. Would you begin to pray over these now? Absolutely. Lord, we are so thankful that you are there. We are so thankful that you love us, and you love all these people that have called in. Um, help them to know that, Lord. Help them to know that uh, you are there for them no matter what their situation is and how bad things are going.